Hi all, today's lesson is on electrical components. So let's have a look at our lesson objectives. So by the end of today's lesson, you should be able to identify a number of electrical components from their circuit symbols and explain their function. The IGCC requires you to identify components from their circuit symbols. And so I'm gonna spend the next three slides just going over those symbols. We're going to start on the top left hand corner here we have the symbol for a cell if we put multiple cells in series we get what we call a battery and there are two different symbols for a battery one um, is either when they're just in series so that's this one here or um, you sometimes see it with a dash line in between so that symbol here they're identical they're both batteries there's no difference between the two it's just two different symbols for the same thing the next one down, so this symbol here is for a power supply. So that's when we're using uh, a power supply as opposed to a battery. And if that power supply is providing an AC supply, then we put a wiggly line in the gap between the two circles. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about AC and DC supplies in another lesson. We then move on to a junction, which is uh, this symbol here. And then at the bottom of this side, we've got a lamp. Coming up to the top right hand side, we have a switch um, and then we have an earth wire or ground. I'm going to talk more about earth wires uh, in another lesson. The last four don't need a huge amount of explanation in terms of their function, but I do want you to be able to recognize each of these symbols. So the first one is an electric bell. The next one is a buzzer, not a huge difference between the two. Uh, and the next one is a microphone and the final one, a loudspeaker. Like I say, they don't really need a huge amount of explanation as to what they are. Okay, so the next few are different types of resistor. So we have a normal fixed resistor to start with, um, then moving on to a variable resistor. So in a previous lesson, I probably talked about a rheostat being set up as a variable resistor. Effectively, it's a resistor which resistance is varied by some form of mechanical means. So by moving something, we can change its resistance. The next one here is a thermistor. I'm gonna talk about that in a second in a bit more detail. And then we've got an LDR, a light dependent resistor. Again, that's gonna feature later on in the lesson. And the one at the bottom here is a heater. Uh, again, doesn't really need a huge amount of explanation. It's quite straightforward. It gets hot when a current passes through it. Moving on to the right hand side, the top one again doesn't really need much explanation, it's a motor. Uh, and likewise, the second one down is a generator. So, um, in the past, we probably would have talked about a dynamo, so something that um, turns kinetic energy into a DC um, uh, current. But this is actually going to provide us with a AC current. So, a generator uh, is something that turns kinetic energy into uh, effectively an AC electrical supply. The next three, again, are symbols that you should already be uh, comfortable with and should recognize. We have an ammeter, so for measuring current. We then have a voltmeter for measuring potential difference or voltage. And the last one is this galvanometer. And the galvanometer is effectively just a very sensitive ammeter. Okay, in the last slide, the first one, we have here a potential divider. So I've got a whole uh, lesson coming up on that. So don't worry about too much about it now, but um, there will be another lesson on potential dividers. Um, we've then got here uh, a, a relay coil uh, and a relay is something, again, is going to feature later on in this lesson. The third one on this list is then a transformer. Now, transformers are something we're not going to cover until you get into year 11. So don't worry too much about them now. But like I say, here is the symbol for it for when you get to that. The next two are diodes. So this is a standard diode. Again, I'm going to talk about that in a, in a minute. And this is a light emitting diode. Again, this is going to feature later on in the lesson. And then this one here is a fuse. Again, that's going to be coming up in a second. Um, we then come up to the top right hand side and we have an oscilloscope. I'm going to do uh, that in a completely separate lesson. Um, and then we've then got a series of logic gates uh, and we're going to spend quite a few lessons talking about logic gates later in the year. So I'm going to go into some of these components in a little bit more detail. Um, the first one is a variable resistor. You can see in the top right hand corner the circuit symbol for a variable resistor. It's just a normal resistor with an arrow pointing up and to the right through that resistor. 
Um, what a variable resistor is, is a resistor that's resistance can be changed uh, by some mechanical way. So, uh, I mean, we generally mean by moving something. Um, we've already covered in the course so far how the resistance of a wire is affected by its length. So if we change the length of the wire through which the current is passing, we can change the resistance. Um, so we can see here um, on the left hand side, we have our current passing through a uh, relatively short length of wire L1. Now if we move our slider to the right, to here, that length has increased and therefore the resistance will have increased. Um, I'm going to show you a video now of uh, a rheostat being used in this way. So this here is a rheostat set up as a variable resistor. This black coil is wound around the drum and this slider can be moved left or right to change where this bar is coming into contact with that coil. Current flows from positive to negative, so we're going to be coming from the positive terminal of our power supply through our ammeter. That's just there so we can see what effect moving this slider is going to have on our current. We're then going to run along this bar to the slider, down into the coil, and then we're only going to pass through this section of the coil before coming out through our lamp and back up to our power supply. If I move this over to the right, the current is going to have to pass through more of this coil and therefore the resistance is going to go up. If I move it over to the left, we're going to have to pass through less of the coil so the resistance is going to go down. So if I turn my power supply on, we can see that as I move this to the right, we're going to be passing through more of that coil so the resistance is going to go up, hence that current is going to come down. Likewise, if I move this over to the left, we're going to pass through less of the coil, so the resistance is going to go down, that current is going to go up. And if I move it all the way over, the current's actually going to get high enough for me to actually start seeing some light from our lamp. So just to summarise, all I'm doing is moving this slider left and right, uh, and because the current is coming along this bar from the slider into this coil, by moving it to the right, I'm increasing the length of that coil, um, and I'm therefore increasing the resistance. If I move it to the left, I'm decreasing the length of that coil and therefore I am decreasing the resistance. Okay, so the next uh, component I want to talk about is a light dependent resistor. Again, the circuit symbol is in the top right hand corner. A light dependent resistor, known as an LDR, is a resistor that's resistance varies depending on the amount of light that strikes it. So the higher the amount of light intensity, the lower the resistance and vice versa. Again, I have a short video here that you can watch which will uh, kind of explain and show you what happens when that light intensity changes. Here I have an LDR, that's a light dependent resistor. The LDR is actually at the base of this tube down there. The purpose of the tube is to stop any external light shining down it. So only the light that I intentionally shine down that tube is gonna strike that LDR. Now I have that LDR connected to a multimeter meter, which is currently set up as a resistance meter. The setting on that is currently in kilo ohms. So we can see there that that is 6.4 kilo ohms or 6,400 ohms. What I'm now gonna do is shine a light down that tube and we can see that that 6.4 has dropped to 0.3. So we've gone from 6,400 ohms down to 300 ohms. As soon as I remove it, we come back up to what 6.5, so 6,500 ohms. So what we're seeing there is as the light intensity shining on the LDR increases, the resistance decreases. Likewise, when the light intensity decreases, the resistance increases. Now, why is that happening? Well, one of the things that affects resistance is the presence of charge carriers within the material. Now, an LDR is made from a semiconductor, and as light shines on that material, on that semiconductor material, more electrons are released and so there are more free electrons present in the material and therefore the resistance decreases. As soon as the light is removed those free electrons are no longer free and therefore the number of free electrons present in the material decreases and so the resistance increases. You not really, um, uh, you don't really need to be able to explain why it happens, but you definitely do need to know what happens to an LDR when the light intensity changes. So just to recap, as light intensity increases, the resistance 
decreases and vice versa. The next component I want to mention is the thermistor. The circuit symbol for a thermistor is in the top right hand corner. So a thermistor is a resistor that's resistance varies depending on its temperature. Now with most pieces of metal, as its temperature increases, the lattice of vibrating ions through which the electrons have to move is vibrating more. And so those charge carriers, those electrons, find it more difficult to traverse that metal. So the higher the temperature, the higher the resistance. But with a thermistor, it's the opposite. So the higher the temperature of a thermistor, the lower the resistance and vice versa. Now that's due to the fact that as the temperature increases, the number of charge carriers, i.e. the number of free electrons, increases. So more free electrons get released as the temperature rises. You don't need to know how or why this change occurs. You just need to remember that as the temperature goes up, the resistance comes down. Before we look at the thermistor, I thought we'd start by just recapping what we know about a normal piece of metal. So what I have here is a piece of copper that is connected to a multimeter, which is currently being used as a resistance meter. That is in mega ohms, so that's 17.2, is actually 17 million 200 thousand ohms, a very high resistance. What I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna heat up this wire using this Bunsen burner. Now, as soon as I do that, we can see that that resistance has gone up. Now, why is that happening? Well, think about the structure of that. i turn this off. Think about the structure of that piece of copper. We have a lattice of vibrating ions through which mobile charge carriers, our electrons, are trying to move. Now, as the temperature of that copper increases, that lattice of vibrating ions gains kinetic energy, they're vibrating more vigorously, and that makes it more difficult for those electrons to pass through that material. So with a normal piece of metal, as the temperature goes up, the resistance goes up. And we just saw that quite nicely. Now what I want to do is I want to have a look at a thermistor. So over here, I've got a thermistor set up. Oh. So this here is my thermistor. Um, it, uh, this is actually now, I believe, in kilo ohms rather than mega ohms. So that is 6,100 ohms. And actually, as soon as I hold on to this, we can see that just from the temperature of my hand, the resistance of that thermistor has actually started to drop. So it's doing the opposite thing. As the temperature is going up, the resistance is coming down. Um, just to uh, show you this, um, a little bit better. I've got here some freshly boiled water. Now, what are we at the moment? 4.8 to 4,800. If I put that into that freshly boiled water, it drops down to what 1.3, 1.2, probably going to 1.1. It's reaching thermal equilibrium with that water, and as the temperature of the thermistor increases, the temperature is decreasing. And what I've got here is some ice water. So if I take that out, place the same thermistor into some ice water, we'll see that that resistance instantly starts to increase again. So with a normal piece of wire, we saw that as the temperature went up, the resistance went up. And like I say, that was because of the fact that that lattice of vibrating ions um, was vibrating more vigorously. It's a slightly different explanation for what's happening with the thermistor. The other thing that affects resistance is the number of free electrons present in the material. Now, as the temperature of your thermistor goes up, the number of free electrons increases, and so the resistance comes down. Likewise, as the temperature goes down, the number of free electrons present in the material decreases, and so the resistance increases. So just to recap, with a normal piece of metal, as the temperature goes up, the resistance goes up, and vice versa. However, with a thermistor, as the temperature comes up, the resistance comes down and vice versa. With the IGCSE, you do not need to be able to explain why these cha uh, the change with the thermistor occurs. You do need to be able to explain why the change with the normal piece of metal occurs, but you don't need to be able to explain why the change in resistance occurs with a thermistor. However, you do definitely need to understand the relationship between temperature and resistance, i.e. For a thermistor, as the temperature goes up, the resistance comes down and vice versa.
The next component I want to mention is a diode. So a diode is a component that only conducts in one direction. So we've already done the IV characteristic for this and you've written a conclusion based on that. So um, you know, this is something you should have seen already. They um, act effectively as a one-way valve in an electrical circuit. To demonstrate the point, I've got here a diode. Um, I'm going to put a, a potential difference across it in this way. Now, if you remember, current always moves from positive to negative, And so the current is going to try and go through it in this direction. Now, when the current is trying to go in the same direction as the arrow that represents it, so this is the arrow that represents the diode, uh, when the current is going in the same direction, you're going to have a low resistance and so the current is going to flow. Um, if you remember uh, from the IV characteristic, it doesn't happen for very low voltages. So below around 0 0.6 volts, you're not going to get any current at all. But once you get to that 0 0.6 volts, um, the, the resistance is going to fall to effectively zero and you're going to have the, the current shooting up very, very quickly. Um, however, if we do it the other way around, so now uh, I've got uh, the terminals switched. So now the current is going to be going in the opposite direction. So that's going to be trying to go to the left. It's now going in the opposite direction to this arrow. And therefore, you're going to have this really high resistance. No current is going to flow. Um, diodes can be very useful for protecting other components in circuits. So there are some components uh, not on our course, so something like a capacitor, that if you were to connect them the wrong way around, if you were trying to, to get a current to flow the wrong way through a capacitor, that capacitor will just instantly break. Um, and so um, the uh, diode is, is placed next to a capacitor in order to make sure that never happens. There are some other uses for diodes which we'll cover later in the course, but for now, all I want you to remember is that a diode is effectively a one-way valve. It only allows current to pass through it in one direction. A light-emitting diode, so an LED, um, is a, a diode that happens to emit light when a current flows through it. Um, the, uh, the biggest benefit of using an LED over a normal filament lamp is that it is far more efficient because it's not re relying on the filament getting incredibly hot. And so it produces very little heat in comparison to a filament lamp. It is really important that you remember, however, that um, as with diodes, they only conduct in the positive direction. If you were to connect an LED uh, in the negative direction, so if you were going to try and get the current to flow through it, in that direction, um, then it's just not going to work. You're not going to get any light being emitted from it. You're not going to get any current flowing in your circuit. So it is still a diode. It just happens to emit light when a current flows through it in the positive direction. OK, uh, relays. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on relays because I think they're very important. A relay is a magnetically operated switch. So in this left hand circuit here, I have a very low voltage supply. So I'm going to get a low current passing through my circuit. Now, as soon as that happens, my relay, which is this component here, is um, going to um, become magnetic. So it's a, it's a little um, um, electromagnet. Um, so when I shut this switch, this electromagnet is going to turn on. And what that's then going to do, it's going to pull this switch over, which is going to complete this circuit here. Um, and um, though you'll notice that this is actually a high current, high voltage. Um, so I don't actually have to physically touch that high voltage, high current circuit in order to get it to turn on or off. So one of the, the primary kind of uh, uh, purposes of a relay is as a, as a safety device because it enables me to turn on or off a high voltage high current circuit without actually physically coming into contact with it. I um, can just come into contact with this low voltage circuit which then turns on this high voltage circuit. So that first reason for it is going to be safety. I'm going to go through a second purpose for it in the next slide. So we've just seen that relays can be used to make systems safer because I don't have to come in contact with that high voltage, high current supply in order to turn it on or off. Um, but another uh, reason for using a relay is to make systems more efficient. In this diagram here, I have a motor uh, connected to a high voltage supply, but they're really far apart. So I purposely made this a very long circuit because they're over a great distance. Now, if you remember, when current passes through a wire, that wire gets hot 
And so uh, the whole time current is passing through these really long wires, that wire is going to be getting hot, so I'm going to be losing energy. They were supposed to be arrows showing heat leaving from it. That was terrible. Um, I will give up trying to do that. Um, but effectively, what's going to happen is these wires here and here are going to get super hot because of the fact there's a current flowing through them, a large current flowing through them. So one of the other reasons we'd use a, a relay is to avoid that happening. So what we've got here is a low voltage, low current supply that is kind of uh, conducting our current all the way down to the other end of our wires to our relay. That is then pulling this switch over here, which completes our circuit on the right, turning our motor on. So because of the fact that we've got a low current in these wires here, we're not now going to be losing all that heat in the same way that we were with the first circuit. So because the long wires only have a low current passing through them, less energy is lost in the form of heat. One way this is used is in cars. So you might have your uh, starter motor down here somewhere in your bonnet um, with your battery, uh, but the switch for it is all the way up here by the um, user in the or the driver in the car. Now, if you had high currents passing through this cable connecting the two, you are going to get lots of energy being lost in the form of heat. So instead, what you're going to do is you're going to have a relay low current, low voltage circuit running all the way down, and then your relay down at the end here, which then turns on your low voltage, and so your high voltage, high current motor down in the uh, engine compartment. So there are lots of places relays are used, but that's just one example. So another component you need to be familiar with is a fuse. The circuit symbol for it is up here. A fuse is a really basic uh, component uh, that effectively melts when the current exceeds a specific value. And by melting, it then breaks that circuit and stops any current from flowing. So this means that if I've got a electrical device that develops a fault, uh, and which results in the current going up, rather than the whole device getting damaged because of the fact that I've got too much current flowing through it, the fuse will melt and effectively will sacrifice itself to save the rest of that device. Now, UK plugs tend to have fuses with either 3 amp, 5 amp or 13 amp ratings. There have been questions in the IGCSE in the past where you have had to select an appropriate fuse. And if you're ever asked to do that, what you need to do is you need to choose the fuse that is above but closest to the normal operating current of your device. So say, for example, I had a device that um, required when it was operating normally a current of 4.5 amps through it i'm not going to use a 3 amp fuse because that's going to melt every time i turn my device on um, whereas one i go for would be a 5 amp likewise i wouldn't use a 13 amp because that's way too high so i'm going to choose the closest to that is above and like i said that's going to be a 5 amp fuse in this case likewise if i had a a, a device that required or had a current of say for example uh, 7.2 amps running through it i'd use a 13 amp fuse i can't use a three or a five because they're going to melt every time i turn my device on so always go for the fuse that is above your normal operating current but closest to it so one of the problems with traditional fuses like those i've just shown you is that once that current limit has been exceeded and they've melted that's it that fuse is broken and will need to be replaced Instead, in our homes, we tend to use circuit breakers now, which are magnetically operated switches that will switch themselves off when that current limit is exceeded. Now, the great thing about using a circuit breaker is that you can just flick that switch back on again and you don't need to go in and replace anything. So whereas with a traditional fuse, it needs to be replaced with a circuit breaker, you can just flick it back on again. With both fuses and with circuit breakers, you need to wait for the current in the circuit to exceed the specific limit before it will shut itself off or melt in the case of a normal fuse. So um, that can actually therefore be quite slow to respond. Now, there's another kind of component that we sometimes use that you should be aware of called an RCD. That's a residual current device. 
Now, the way an RCD works is by comparing the current in the live and the neutral wire. And as soon as it detects a difference in those two wires, it knows that current must be getting out somewhere, must be a leakage of current. Um, and it, so it knows there must be something wrong. And so it instantly shuts itself off. Um, now, these are much, much faster to respond than a traditional fuse or a circuit breaker. And you tend to find these things uh, where there's a high risk of you accidentally cutting through a cable, for example. So if you're uh, out in the garden using a hedge trimmer or a chain, electric chainsaw, then that device will almost guarantee to have an RCD in it. Because if you were to accidentally cut through that cable or cut through that wire, then it's instantly going to shut off that electrical supply and you're going to be safe. So just to summarize, we have now looked at all of the different circuit symbols you need to be able to recognize. And I've gone into slightly more detail with a few of them that you may not have seen before. So please make sure if you haven't been doing it throughout the video, you go back and make a note of all of those circuit symbols, write some notes on some of the ones I've gone into a little bit more detail on, uh, and just try and commit them to memory so that if they ever come up in an exam or a test, you can recognize their symbols and you know what that component does and how it functions.